Good evening, and welcome to the Mill Valley Historical Society First Wednesday Speaker Series, an event we host the first Wednesday of every month. So sorry for our delay. We had a little early technical difficulty, so we're running a little late, but here we are. My name is Deborah Schwartz, and I'm on the board of directors for the Mill Valley Historical Society in charge of the oral history program and the first Wednesday speaker series. It is my hope as director of this series to bring you an array of historical topics to explore. Last month, we learned about ghost ships of the San Francisco Bay Area. And this month and next, we turn our attentions to the rich history of music in Mill Valley. Tonight's talk is titled Prune Music, So Much More Than a Music Store with founders David Kessner and Randall Smith, along with co-owners Bill Steele and Larry Craig. Also with us tonight is Franklin Walder from the Mill Valley Public Library. You can't see him, but he's the man behind the curtain helping to keep things running smoothly. Thank you, Franklin. And of course, we want to thank the Mill Valley Public Library for allowing us to host our series in this safe and accessible format. Before we begin, I want to say to those of you in the audience who are already members of the Mill Valley Historical Society, thank you for your generosity and your interest. Your membership allows us to continue our efforts to infuse history into the present through speaker presentations such as tonight's, oral interviews, history walks, history plaques, and the collaboration to restore and return to Mill Valley engine number nine the last remaining locomotive from the Mount Tamalpais Scenic Railroad. And for those of you who are not yet members, please join us. Membership ensures that you will be alerted to future talks, our annual Memorial Weekend Walk on Into History Tour, Chuck Olenberg's charming Mill Valley History vignettes, and you will be updated about other historical events in our town and nearby. Membership to our organization is so affordable and just a click away on the Mill Valley Historical Society website. For practical purposes, the audience must be muted for this webinar, but functional tools are located at the bottom of your screen to help us communicate with each other. If you can't see those tools, just hover your cursor over the area and they should appear. Now look for the chat icon. The chat tool allows you to post comments, say hello to friends, and we encourage you to add substantive information during this presentation. Next is the Q&A option. The Q&A option is where you can post questions you may have about tonight's presentation, and I'll address those questions to our panel after their talk. But if you have comments or personal stories to share, the chat room is the best place for that. Tonight's talk will be in a, in a Q and A format that will last about an hour, and after we'll take time for questions and comments from the audience. This event is being recorded and will be available on the Mill Valley Historical Society website in about three or four days. Just click events, select first Wednesday lecture series, and you'll find tonight's recording as well as many others. In the 1960s and 70s, Mill Valley was a bastion of musical creativity and performance. On November 17th, Sweetwater Music Hall will be celebrating 50 years of feeding the soul of Mill Valley and the greater Bay Area with music, art, and community. But equally impactful, especially to musicians, and people in the community who wanted to be in musicians or were interested in music, the place to go was prune music. Prune music was the meeting spot for may, many Bay Area musicians who relied on the store for a variety of services. Tonight, prune music founders, David Kessner and Randy Smith, along with co-owners, Bill Steele and Larry Craig are here to discuss the history of prune music and the musical culture that it supported and helped to create David Kessner co-founded Prune Music in Berkeley in 1968 with Randy Smith. He opened Prune Music in Mill Valley on Sunnyside in 1969. Later, he opened and operated the church recording studio in San Anselmo, 
from 1972 to 79. He still performs and writes songs for music and TV. And so we give a warm welcome first to David. Hi, David. Thank you for Hi. joining us. Hi, great to be here. Good to be with you. Good. And next we have Rand Randall Smith, Randy Smith, who co-founded Prune Music, a leading guitar amplifier repairman and innovator of numerous amp technologies. Randy holds over 50 pa patents. Randy also founded amp manufacturer Mesa Boogie. Welcome, Randy. So nice to have you with us. Yeah, thank you, Deborah. Actually, it's about 20 patents, not 50. 20. 20 Ooh, I'm bragging. I'm like exaggerating. That. Well, 20 then. Thanks for the correction. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Next is Bill Steele, who met David Kessler and Randy Smith at Prune, Prune Music in 1968 at the Berkeley store and joined them in their new adventure in Mill Valley. And in 2005, Bill co-founded Great Wilderness, a conservation nonprofit working in South America. Bill also serves on the board of directors for the West Marin Community Services. Welcome, Bill. Hi, Deborah. Nice to be here. Nice to have you. And finally, we have Larry Craig from Prune Music's Guitar Repairman. And he's still doing this, actually. Man. Larry spent 35 years touring as Neil Young's guitar and amp tech and was the baritone sax player in Neil Young and the Blue Tones. He currently serves as a consultant on development of the new mag magnetone amplifiers and has a guitar repair shop in San Anselmo and owns Vignette Instrumental Rental. I interviewed Larry some years ago. You can hear his oral history if you go to our oral history collection. Larry, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy to have you all here to, to talk about prune music. I, I've interviewed so many musicians, and every single one talks about prune music. So obviously, you were so impactful. I, I think we should get jumping. You ready to start talking about prune music? Let's go. Yeah. OK, let's go. Let's begin with David and Randy. Let's go back in time to Berkeley and the birth of prune music. Uh, now, in our pre-talk interviews, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I pretty much surmised that this is, you two were a couple of hippies, loved music, living in the East Bay, Tell me about that time. Tell me about how you found each other and how you opened Prune Music. I don't know if I remember exactly how we found each other. We were in a band together called Martha's Laundry and we were not very good, but we were playing around as much as we could. And then I realized that when uh, something in the band, somebody's gear in the band broke, Randy would just fix it. And so here was a guy that could actually do something. And it was, it seemed to me, my recollection is it was really tough to find, to get your gear repaired in those days. There really wasn't anybody else. And so uh, I don't know how the idea popped into my head, but I said, Randy, hey, let's open a music store. And he said, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty much the way I remember it. But I, uh, my memory's a little clearer about that Sun 200S amp of yours blowing up on a gig with, you know, sparks and flame and smoke and it dying. And you were pretty devastated, as we all were, because, shit, what do we do now? We don't have any money. <clears throat> you can't afford a new amp. What are you going to do? And I said, hey, let me have a look. Maybe I can fix it. And you were pretty worried that I was going to make it even worse. <laughs> and I said, you know, uh, no, I guarantee you, I won't make it any worse. And uh, unbeknownst to you, I, you know, messed with some ham radio stuff when I was much younger. And when I took it apart, I saw eh, the usual bunch of burned up parts. And I went down and bought replacement resistors and a capacitor or two, put it all back together and, and it worked. And, <clears throat> you know, I was probably as I was pleased, and I think you were surprised, but you were the one that had the great observation from that, <laughs> which was, you know, to me, that was just what you had to do. I had this car that broke down about twice every week. So, you know, just keeping it working was just how you got through life. But you had the brains to say, hey, let's open a music store, which to me was so out there. I, I couldn't even believe it. 
but you did say, hey, you can fix this shit and nobody, you know, everybody's playing in bands and there's a need for this. And as I recall, you said, and I found a storefront on Grove Street for $75 a month. So I said, <laughs> okay, let's sell some of our gear. And man, it was, it was brilliant, Dave. Thank you for that idea. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Randy, I have to ask you, you, so much of your life has been involved with electronics were you trained did you have any training at all none whatsoever never took a class in my life <clears throat> and yet you just had the skill well, it, it, you know first of all the tube amps for guitars that they're, they're not that mysterious and they're not that difficult to figure out and that was the prevailing technology at that time i got interested in electronics believe it or not through a Boy Scout wood carving merit badge where the guy who was a merit badge counselor, uh, first he cut up my wood carvings and threw them in a wastebasket and told me I was, he said two things that really stuck with me. First thing he said was whenever you make something, Sonny, you're leaving behind an artifact of your values at the time. And looking at this stuff, either you're hopeless or you didn't try very hard. That was a great big lesson. But where that got into electronics is he was building electronic stuff in his home shop. In fact, the project was the heating and air conditioning control panel for the USS Nautilus, our first atomic submarine. That puts it in 1956 or 57. I would have been 10 years old. At any rate, his older son was making ham radio stuff. And I was so impressed by how all the stuff they built. I just wanted to do it. So I started building stuff there and did that for as a hobby for a couple of years and then you know grew up into cars and girls and you know forgot about it until dave's amp blew up <laughs> so let's talk about berkeley at that time what's going on in berkeley well berkeley was a lot of hippies the whole summer of love thing was pretty new uh very political time um the People's Park riots, I think, were in 69. I'm not sure, 68 or 69. The, the town was occupied by the National Guard and there were troops everywhere and there was a curfew. I remember Randy and I getting pulled over after curfew one night for, you know, just because we were driving around somewhere. So it was an interesting time. Uh, we, I think we, somebody fired a couple of shots through our window of the new store and. Oh, yeah. And then we realized uh, we couldn't get insurance for that anymore once that had happened. But we we just, you know, I loved, I still love Berkeley. I loved it back then. I love it now. And we just had a great time there. We opened our little store, hung our band gear on the wall, and uh, hoped people would come in, and they did. They started coming in. Where was right. the store located? located? was on Grove Street uh, off of Rose, which is now uh, Martin Luther King Way. It was and, a little tiny store with a, had been some kind of market and there was a freezer locker and that's where Randy set up shop. And I manned the front of the store, a little counter. And you had to get a business license and everything. We were informed that we had to get a business license. So we did, which is, everything was very easy back then. I have to ask, how did the store get its name? You know, I think it just kind of popped into my head, but probably from some Frank Zappa record. But I, I don't have a real clear picture of what led me to that. Maybe Randy does. I don't know. I, I think you came up with it. And yeah, I don't know where it came from. Not? I really said it, and he said, okay. Yeah, we weren't taking anything too seriously at that time. Well, where did that story I know about that issue come from? I didn't make the whole thing up. Well, what is the story that you're thinking of? The story I'm thinking of is that uh, the, didn't you guys have a, a place about a half a block down on Grove on the other side of the street? Didn't you have a house there? Uh, not not Randy. Um, I did. I had an apartment. Yeah, you did. I had an apartment so, yeah. down there. And around so. the corner was Fat Dog, who still has Subway guitars in Berkeley. Right. And, uh, and he was, so he was, uh, Randy tells a good story about Fat Dog. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, there was some really good Afghani hash around and 
Uh, the story I heard maybe from Stu. I think Stu Feldman might have been around at that time. Is that correct? He too? Was, yeah, he was at the store in Berkeley. I, I, I also watched the store at Berkeley sometimes, and he would just hang out there along with Jim okay. Lee. So the story I heard was that you were the business license became a thing, and then you said, Well, what are we going to name this? You know, and, and uh, so somebody suggested, Well, let's take a really big hit a hash and then concentrate on it you know like naming a band is what this was really it's like naming a band and uh uh so that happened and then the freak out album was on and somewhere in the middle there frank zappa whispers we're all prunes and oh that's it that's the way i heard the story but i could be completely exaggerating that uh, but i refuse to stop because it could have um, been could have, could have actually happened that way that's just one of the lies i live by you know <laughs> okay so in no time suddenly possibly to your surprise the store is quite busy everybody's bringing their stuff to you yeah i remember a seminal moment where a truck pulled up a truck uh and it was it was uh, Country Joe and the Fish's gear. David Faison was their roadie at that time. Yeah. And I remember him saying to me, he said, uh, well, we're getting ready to go out on a tour. And this stuff really takes a beating. And as he was saying that, he opened the back tailgate of the door and an, an offender dual showman head fell out onto the sidewalk right then. <laughs> and I thought, wow, he's not kidding. This stuff takes a beating. Look at that. So I pioneered the hammer test uh, and every amp then and till today at Mesa Boogie is turned up full blast and beat to death with a, with a hammer. And the idea is, well, anything that breaks, you fix and you keep fixing it until you can pound on it endlessly with a hammer and nothing further will break. Um, and that that's kind of pretty much the key to a rock and roll life. <laughs> I see Larry smiling. He knows all about that. Yeah, I've seen, I saw him do it. Also, he'd take a great big um, Phillips head screwdriver and run it up and down the um, circuit board, too. But I, he took a ball peen hammer and beat on this thing, you know? Anyway, it would freak people out because they think you're going <laughs> to destroy your amplifier. But actually, what you're doing is you're making it reliable because in those yeah. days, the tubes and the construction. It wasn't as good as what we've got now. And so really mechanical vibration and the life of the road really did contribute to a good number of the failures. Ah. Okay, so you're doing pretty well in Berkeley, but all of a sudden you move over to Mill Valley. Why? What happened? My, my recollection as a friend, and I'm not sure who, if it might have been more than one person, told us, all the rock stars are moving to mill valley you guys should move over there too and so we we'll do that we went over to marin and looked around and it just really looked great to us so we just found a storefront and opened the second store on sunnyside now my my recollection is that and a little bit different first of all there had been a uh, some sort of a protest march and a riot right down grove street right in front of the store. Now, I was a student at Berkeley, so I was used to getting tear gassed and hassled and all of that. You know, that was an ongoing thing. But man, it was like, Dave, they, these these guys are just about ready to break into our store. And then, now correct me, maybe you remember this, Bill, but I thought you, Bill Steele, on the way out of the store said something like, wow, this is really a great store. We need something like this over in Mill Valley. And the way I remember it, Dave, is that you and I looked at each other and went, holy mackerel, he's right. Let's do it before he does. And we got into your Corvair van, drove right over there and found the one place available, which was 34 Sunnyside. Yeah, I, I, that's that's the way I remember it, too, Randy. Okay. And, and, and also, there's a little bit more to that is Greg Mason, this guy that was dealing drugs over in Marin, was going to back me to open a music store in san and selmo but uh but then you you guys jumped to it and asked me if i wanted to come you know be part of that instead of doing the music store in san and selmo i guess the early that's just in those huh? days that was eliminating the competition in the you know heading it off at the pass yeah right yeah 
Well, it was a good idea. Thanks, Bill, for that, because we were really sick of Berkeley at that time. And we thought Marin County and Mill Valley was Shangri-La. Yeah. I don't know if you remember this, Randy, but at some point you actually installed pipes in our front windows so that, you know, if someone broke the glass, they couldn't get in as easily. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I, what I do remember dealing with a landlord in his famous Grasha Russia Purity. I said, <laughs> what? He was a Chinese, old Chinese gentleman. He's a great guy. Go, grass your rusherability. And I couldn't figure out. And I, finally, I figured it out. Oh, the glasses are less ability, responsibility, liability, whatever it was. But you're right. Couldn't get insurance on it. Yeah, we couldn't get insurance once the riots started happening. Nobody would. Right. So us- how old are you two when you become business owners, approximately? How old were we? Yeah. What age were you? 1820 something like that well i think 20 i think i was 23 and 68. yeah i must have been 20 i, I don't know who knows we still yeah. haven't grown up very young yeah very young but i mean it was just nobody really said hey don't do this or you can't do this or you know yeah okay so you move over to mill valley and to the store moves to mill valley and now we enter bill and larry and in our pre-talk interviews one topic comes up again and again the motorcycle accident no (laughs) so larry and bill you want to jump in here and describe about that moment that changed well larry and i were in a band out in lagunitas uh and uh living out there and uh i was married to lindy uh at the time and uh at the argentina house in in lagunitas yeah it was big brother's old house up on the end of spring road there in lagunitas and they had just moved out and somehow we got that house Uh, i think Les might have got it cardoza tony cardoza but we got that house and joined those two brothers Les and tony cardoza in a band and uh so then the thing with david and randy happened where they asked me to join them in uh in their endeavor in mill valley run you know run that mill valley store until they could uh till they figured out what to do with it and all that and uh instead of opening the store i was going to open with greg mason which i was just elated about because he was a little difficult to deal with um and uh i was riding a motorcycle out by the san geronimo valley golf course on the back road meadow way i think they call it and uh i got to a corner and i was indecisive crashed into a telephone pole guy wire lindy was thrown free thankfully and didn't get badly injured but I broke my femur and that cost me a year almost of recovery uh although I went back to work before I was fully recovered but I was in a body cast for about six months and so it was a very traumatic thing for me fortunately Larry was right there I said hey Larry can you cover me on this and go do prune well turn that decision right there that just asking the fact that Larry and I were together at that moment was just really sweet it, it, it changed my life completely started a whole new path for me yeah and me I, too I, right? I've been, hmm? and me too because it held the position for me and then i was able to join later after i was uh you know well, well i had been fixing guitar since i was 14 learned how to straighten necks and do intonation from the guy in the back of uh, the little old guitar repair guy german guy uh uh, in the store where I was taking banjo and guitar lessons. So that was the, my only um, uh, instruction. So I started working on my own guitars and my friend's guitars, but this is back in what, 65, 64, right in there. Anyhow, so Bill asked, well, can you watch the store for me? And I was you know, getting $10 a day and I was so poor that uh, I said, hey, yeah. Ten dollars a day is better than no dollars a day. So I started walk, watching the store and all those uh, Leo's music, um, uh, re, you know, their uh, trade-ins, you know, and they were just terrible shape. And they were hanging up on one side and on the other side in this store. 
And since I knew how to fix guitars, I went ahead and fixed them one at a time because no, hardly anybody came into that little store on Sunnyside. It was pretty dead. And so I just passed the time because I liked fixing guitars. I'd always done it for my friends, never thought of charging for it. And um, But uh, when they moved to uh, Locust, they said, okay, you're our guitar repairman. And so instantly I'm working for the Grateful Dead, Big Brother, Quicksilver, Country Joe, um, you know, yeah. You know, Jefferson Airplane. I mean, I was working for all of them yeah. immediately. And here I'm 21. But I knew I was good at it because I've been doing it for a while. And I love doing it. And I still do. And you were paid how much per guitar back then? Well, $18. That was a huge upgrade in pay for me. And so, yeah, $18 a guitar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And at that time, I was fixing everybody's amplifiers. And uh, the standard bench fee was 7 bucks. <laughs> and that got your amp fixed. <laughs> David, you described meeting Bill for the first time in the Berkeley store as he hobbles in with the help of his lady in a body cast, right? Right. I think he, they had a Volks. My recollection, and you can correct me, Bill, if needed. They had a Volkswagen Beetle, and they had taken out the front passenger seat and bill with his body cast somehow could get in the back seat and lindy would drive him around yeah and they start coming around the berkeley store yeah yes yeah, so and that body cast was and it, interestingly about that body cast is that uh i was at the time you know the vietnam war was a big issue and i was uh in the national guard so i was a uh uh in the military if you will and uh eventually our unit did get called uh to go over and i you know i wasn't going to kill people in vietnam so uh i applied to be a conscious objector and they wouldn't allow me to do that they didn't want me to do that and so i went i went out i went public i did a couple of speeches at rallies in my class a uniform so when I broke my leg, the FBI came into the hospital to arrest me. And the doctor, uh, Carol Kruger, who was an orthopedic surgeon in Marin at the time, wouldn't let him take me. He just stood between me and the FBI, told him, no, you're not taking him. I'm operating on him tomorrow. He's not going anywhere. And they backed off. Uh, so then I got a release date. And because I was in a body uh, cast months later, I got three months, four months later, I got a release date from the hospital. So Larry came three days early, you know, and whooshed me out of the hospital in the middle of the night and took me out to San Geronimo to Greg Mason's house where I was going to be holed up because I thought I was still AWOL. Turns out that the day after the FBI came, they had uh, given me an honorable discharge and thrown thrown my copy in the circular file so that I would just shut up, stay undercover. Yeah, you know, they were they were pretty slick back then. Though there was in the Cohen Pro Cohen Tell Pro days, you know, where they were spying on everybody and what have you. So. Yeah, it's it's important to remember the impact it had, uh, the threat of the draft and the war, and it was tumultuous times, and there was a ubiquitous concern and fear about your life going in a very negative direction if that's how you felt about the war quite quickly so I there's a great movie out now the boys didn't go uh which you guys have probably heard about it in mill valley uh historical society yeah about todd out here who didn't go and it's a i'd recommend that movie to people so let's get back to mill valley and you're in on Sunnyside and there's what's Mill Valley like? I mean, you've got a store next to you called <laughs> Antique Telephone. No, it was the guy that would took that was a hairdresser there. He drove <laughs> around in an old green uh, telephone truck and it was called Antique Telephony. Now, we uh, shared a back room with him. And so in that back room, there was just all these telephones, old telephones that, that he was in the middle of fixing. <laughs> but uh, he worked uh, on the hair of all the older, he was a very suave looking guy, and all the older women just loved him, and so he had a good business. That was next door. He didn't like us much, but what I remember too is the day that we opened, one of the first guys that came in was John Cipollina, 
And he said, hey, I got a broken guitar cord. You think you can fix it? And I said, yeah, let me give, give it to me. And I soldered it up. And man, I'll tell you what, John was so kind. And of course, he became a fan and a great a great uh, friend and client of prune music but he held it up to everybody he said look everybody look at that solder joint man this cord isn't going to break again man that's great and uh, i took that as a good sign and a good endorsement and yeah man i mean we just got the the nod of approval from a major guy yes I was more interested in our other side neighbor to tell you the truth what about it i was more interested in the neighbor on the other side and who was that? The brother's bar for you. Oh, well, that's once you so went. That's to not till later. Yeah, that's yeah, not till on sunny side. Yeah. Side. Yeah. yeah, let's go to Locust. We, oh, we yeah, I thought we were on Locust. So. How long were you at Sunnyside for? Maybe Six so. months or so, or wasn't it? Yeah. As yeah. quick as that was, that was a stopgap so that we could get our, our, our flag planted in Mill Valley head off any potential competition and then when uh, i think dave found uh, the locust street and uh, man that was that was what we were looking for kind of uh, that was the real deal for us partly because it also had a meat locker oh that's yeah. right my office was the meat locker that time but it, right. had, it had room for a shop and we knew what we needed mean? a lot more space what do you mean meat locker an actual meat locker yeah, yeah there it was a you know in the old days it was they were insulated with thick walls and a, and a door that was like thick six inches thick wood paneling on the inside so they looked great and uh you know it was the way the old grocery stores were i guess pre-refrigeration they might have been ice boxes originally yeah. old oak walls and stuff beautiful so yeah. so randy and dave you then moved to mill valley you leave you leave Berkeley behind and go to Mill Valley, correct? Right. Yeah, we were both we're still for a while. We were still trying to keep Berkeley going for a while, but it was it, we lost interest in going over to Berkeley, and we we both around that time we both moved to Marin, and didn't feel like going to Berkeley that much anymore. Eventually, we sold that store off. Not eventually, pretty quickly, probably. I don't know if we sold it or gave it away, but it became a music store um by a guy that was in the band with us and Martha's Laundry later and he's still got a music store in Austin Texas now right. guitar restoration yeah I saw him a couple of years ago Resurrection, I think wasn't it Re resurrection. Yeah, maybe so. yeah. it went from oh, resurrection yeah. to resurrection yeah that was right. Larry Jameson by the way and he painted the sign that it hung on for music the whole time hey. I was Hey, Bill, I got that sign. Fat Dog had that for years, and he kept telling me, I got to come get it. I got to come get it. And I finally went over there last summer, and I got it. He had it up on the ceiling, and oh, I got wow. it. I got it up at my place now, hanging on the wall. Good for it you. Yeah, 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 it looks great. It's all worn. Yeah, I wondered what happened. Man, sign. we got it. <laughs> okay, so now we're entering into the 70s. And this store really had its heyday in the 70s, would you say? at least with your involvement yeah absolutely <laughs> this is the golden years of prune music and yeah. as prune music becomes basically an institution i mean you are well known people depend on you and you have become a meeting place for musicians here's the reasons why because you got larry doing the guitars you got me doing the amps and and we knew good gear and so at this time, Fender was going through the CBS transition and they were making a lot of garbage. The gear was really pretty terrible. And so we had older gear that was good and it worked really well because Larry and I fixed it all up. Yeah. And, and so, I mean- well, Pants could bring their truck up to the back of the store, unload everything, go, uh, Larry and Randy would go through it. If they had drum problems, I took care of that because I had the drum department and uh you know sell them all the hardware they need replenish their stock it was a stop pit stop for touring bands right and that, that was one thing that we did that was really important so we sold mostly used gear we had some new gear but the used gear was better and when we look back now at the prices that are commanded for les paul guitars and stratocasters <laughs> if we had a kept it's some of those that they were worth so much money we'd sell them for like 150 160 175 dollars they're worth ten thousand now a lot of them the less paul's we sell for 300 bucks they're worth 
thousands. Larry's probably got a better idea what that stuff's worth, but well, it's well, astronomical. Uh, uh, Mark Pasternak would drive down to Fresno, buy a bunch of Stratocasters, most of them 50 Stratocasters with maple necks for $250. I'd fix them all up because, you know, they, they're, you know, bad shape, but all the guitars that you bought, I would fix up and you'd hang them on the wall. And that was how I paid my bill was fixing your guy's guitar. And, um, uh, and I think the Stratocaster sold for $650 for a 50 Stratocaster, which is worth Jesus now, 60,000. <laughs> yeah, but those prices I gave were for like 60s strats. And, you know, we thought that, ah, who cares? It's a 60s strat, you know, that's not worth much. So those are only in the 10,000 range, I guess, now for a good one, right, Larry? <laughs> yeah. So I remember when our, during our guitar show, a guy came with four Cherry Sunburst Les Pauls and he tried to sell them to us for $2,000 a piece. And we just <laughs> thought that was the funniest thing. Look yeah. at this guy. He he's trying to sell these. So those are the ones that are worth you know one hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollars now. Easy and a lot of times more. <laughs> well, there's a really famous good guitar player who I still see on occasion, and every time I see him, he still looks at me with kind of a serious face. And this is not a jokester guy uh, about me ripping him off for charging him three hundred and seventy-five dollars for one of those black Les Pauls with the three pickups. You know, $375, and I'm just looking at the guy and going, well, did you keep it? You know, I mean. <laughs> so, speaking of guitars, we've got to talk about one particular guitar maker. He comes up in almost every interview. Uh, Do you know who I'm speaking of? Charlie. Charlie Deal. Oh, the first money I ever made uh, working on guitars, this is before I... Uh, they moved to um, uh, Locust, is, was refinishing toilet seats for Charlie. Yeah. And so I can't remember how much I made. And, you know, the wooden, they had to be wooden. And so I would, you know, you know take the uh, finish off and, and, you know, spray them clear and um, give them back to him. And it, he would go around and get all the parts. And this is later when the uh, store was open, but he didn't really know how to, you know, where to put the bridge and how to make the bridge, how to wire the electronics and how to make it a, go, a going guitar. And so that's what I did. But he got all the parts, put them together, and I made it work. But I, start, I started out be, just refinishing toilet seats for Charlie. So for those that don't know who Charlie Deal is, I know when I moved to Mill Valley in 79, he came right up to me as, as first time I met him and, and pronounced, I make guitars out of toilet seats <laughs> he was a sweet can't play them but i make them <laughs> he was a he was a he was a he's actually a really nice guy yeah yes. he was a little little odd and a little weird and a little slow but a real sweetheart and he, he was coming every every day really so. yeah yeah he was a, he was one of the one of the characters that made yeah. mill valley what it was that's right yeah, you'd wonder what if there was something wrong if he didn't show up, you know, in a day. <laughs> you'd worry about him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there are many customers that seem to come in every single day. Like yeah. who? Like what? Well, tell yeah. about live. Mike Bloomfield. Music. Mike Bloomfield would come in there pretty much every day. Nick yeah. Gravenitis would come in quite a bit. Yep. Yeah. I used to have breakfast with Nick before we opened down at the Mill Valley Cafe or over at Augie's. Well, I'm going to mention one guy who's sitting right here, Doug West. He started coming in. Uh, he says that I don't remember this, but he claims that I sold him his first guitar from Sunnyside. the Sunnyside store when he was eight years old. He's still <laughs> working. At, at, he's a key guy. At, at Write him in here because he, he has a useful perspective, Doug. And I know when I... <laughs> <laughs> when you first I, talked to Doug, you called him Dougie, which tells you how young he, he must have been when you first talked to him. Yeah. Well, we call yeah. him Clone Boy. <laughs> he came on, and the guy that introduced me to him, he said, now this is a real tone boy here. This is the guy. <laughs> you need to listen to this guy. So he started out playtesting amplifiers here, and then, you know, he's my, the other half of the design squad here is, he's the guitar playing guy while I tweak on shit, you know, so. I owe, it all to, I owe it all to these guys. They raised me. Um, I, I was the luckiest kid in the world to be around all these incredible mentors. Larry, love you, man. <laughs> like, Likewise. He yeah. was behind the counter, so he saw it all happen. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I would watch the it. counter when they would go in the back room. Hey, kid, watch the counter. back in the back room. <laughs> one. I, I would just. What I would doing in the back room? I would think I was the coolest guy in the world, you know, just being able to stand behind the counter and smile. And, yeah. Can I help you? I don't know what I'm doing, but can I help you? Yeah. yeah I have Doug, to did you, Doug, did you know Mouse, Mark? Uh, Mark, what's his last name? Um, uh, salute. Anybody else know his last name? The poster um, guy? Mark. No, I, uh, I would just no. say uh, in the theme of young people at Prune Music, here's the way we handle this. We handled all the kids different. When Archie Williams would come in, Archie, we, would be, uh, we would just sit and watch and be in, yeah, right, be in yeah, awe. Not right? worthy. And, Archie okay, Williams. So Mouse Hero. is on the other end of the spectrum. He used to hang around and steal shit and do whatever, you know, I don't know. He And he was fancying himself a little bit of a dart. But he had a bass player friend who I still know who's really good. He made a bunch of albums in the R&B world. And, but he broke into the store one night. Oh right God. through the skylight mark and he got caught by the mill valley police oh right God. so they called us up when we had to come down reset the alarm do all that stuff and uh and then the, uh, they brought mouse in you know by the back of his collar to the store the next day uh you know because i'd talked to the cop and i said we'll bring him down we'll talk to him so they bring him down what do we do we get, we hire him we give him a job okay. <laughs> right? so there was uh, there was a lot of interaction with young people, and those are the kind of two ends of the spectrum, right? Yeah, there. well, yeah. I mean, I just I feel so lucky to have known you all and grown up there in Mill Valley, and it's just incredible. I mean, like Larry said it earlier, my entire life took a different course because of prune music. I mean, yeah. literally. I mean, I wouldn't be yeah, here, my right? yeah. yeah. I mean, when you said that, I was sitting over there going, "Wow." Is he ever telling the truth about my world? And I mean, it's a, and it was an institution for all the young people and all the musicians in the area. It's just I met all my heroes there, and including you all. You know, it's just like it's it was incredible. So thank you all, and could never say thanks big enough to you all. Well, it, thanks for giving us the youthful perspective, Doug. It was Let's amazing. talk about more of the people that were were in the store regularly. I mean. What what was it like? I mean, did it? Did Carlos it, would show up, you know. Uh, I, I mean, he would just bring his own guitars. He'd come and hang out too, you know. And uh, Carlos jamming with Michael Bloomfield. How often would Carlos you see, Santana? I would just be in the Carlos Santana in the in the front room, you know, jamming. Yeah. How cool yeah. is that? Yeah. But everybody would hang out there. Nick Gravenitis would hang out in my shop. Um, Bob Weir would be back there sometimes, and you yeah. know, and and um. Uh, the back room was infamous, back Larry, let's off. face it. The back room was infamous, you have to say yeah, that. Was. Everybody knew about the back room. Well, not everybody. The people that should have known about the back room knew about the back room. And the ones who didn't know could smell it from the front. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so, so let's just, I mean, drugs. Oh. No, never. Uh, in front. Only in <laughs> Yeah, only on Sunday. How about groupies? Because you've got a lot of famous people coming and going. Groupies, men and women. How about uh, that? No. Well, there were oh. some groupies that would stop by, but they were usually with people. And, right. uh, you know, but there were some of them were, you know, people that I knew, you know, from playing gigs. We all went out and played gigs, too. Uh, you know, David and I, for sure did and i used to go out on tour a lot and that's where a lot of the used guitars came from and you know so i'd buy them at pawn shops in oklahoma or someplace you know and bring them back and we'd sell them you know well here's one thing that happened we're talking about uh well, neil young i didn't need, I, I i i was never really i'm not a guitar player and i was more interested in jazz and so somebody said hey uh you need I got somehow I got to go down to Neil Young's ranch and start working on all his amps. And then I ended up going out, called out on tour on the harvest tour because he was having trouble. And I'm and you know, I managed to keep the amps working and, and, and getting them all straightened out, which was no mean feat. He had a trouble with his guitar. And I phoned Larry and I said, Man, Larry, this guitar, this black Les Paul, 
it it won't stay. He tunes it for one chord and the next chord's not in tune. And Larry said, oh yeah, that's the tunematic bridge. It doesn't have enough curve in it. What you need to do is take it off, put it on a couple of blocks and hammer it. So it's got, I said, Larry, it's pop metal, a little break. And he said, no, if you do it, at any rate, I did it and it worked. And Neil- Also the intonation, the string length, also you adjust it over the phone. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, you helped me out when Neil came and it- worked and it solved this big problem where he just he just ruined every show because he couldn't get the guitar right for this ballad thing that he and he said how did you do that what i said you just need to hire larry you know i i just did what larry and larry you pick it up here how'd that change your life well you started bringing me down to the ranch with you and uh you know and so you'd fix the amps i'd fix the guitars i you know neil had a lot of guitars and so i had my hands full and they all needed a lot of work they're in pretty bad shape so i started going through all those and you and me we come back and have uh dinner at original joe's i remember yes. but this got to be a, a regular thing that we do and um you know that's how i got hooked up with neil and needless to say that changed my life a lot because a little bit later in 76 uh uh i got him ready to go to um japan and um uh about two days later apparently uh billy talbot's brother um uh, uh, wasn't he was supposed to be the roadie and he didn't know what he was doing so they called me over and I toured with him for 36 years uh, on every tour after that and uh, luckily yeah. I got you know I was the guy that took care of Neil's guitars and amps and luckily I use and I play a lot of different instruments so usually one or two or three songs and sometimes more I get to play something always you know old man I played the banjo each time you know and he you know and I played piano organ pedal steel uh, Barry, oh, sax. Of stuff. Barry sax that's incredible Barry sax yeah alto sax he came to me in the mid 80s and said uh larry do you play alto sax and i'd grown up as an oboe player you know so i would had many many years of oboe and i said oh yeah you know so they rented me a, a selmer mark six alto sax which i still wow. have that's the best anyway one. it's a great sax i was playing it today but anyway um uh and so i just i they told me what song i was going to be playing on and i practiced all afternoon and sure enough that night i was playing in front of twenty two thousand people and i played it on that one song for the rest of the tour and um same thing happened with the baritone sax and i ended up being in the blue notes so that you know it, it, uh, i was actually he made me uh get on the band bus you know because normally i would get i'd be in the crew bus and we'd get there at six in the morning and I was a crew member. So now I'm traveling with a band bus and they just raged, raged all night long. They went to sleep when the sun came up. Anyhow, we'd get in at 2.30 in the afternoon and I'd get off the, the uh, band bus and all my, I'd gone to the dark side now. So all my roadie buddies would go, here comes Larry, he's coming off the band bus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm sure that. It worked out real good for me because I got paid as a roadie and as a musician. And I had two uh, helpers on my side of the stage. So they took care of most of the stuff. I was like the executive roadie on that side. Oh, man, that's great. What I remember was getting this midnight call. You got to get on the airplane and get out here to Madison, Wisconsin. And, and I did that. And I didn't know what the heck is going on. And I'm bleary eyed. And this uh, this chauffeur grabs my toolbox off the conveyor and says, follow me. And we go out. And here's Leo Makoda, and I've never seen a, never been in a limousine. The back door opens, this buck knife comes out with a six inch line of cocaine on it. He said, Here, this. you're going to need it. Now, this is all emanating from the back room of prune music, right? Yeah. And we're still in, this is, this is the ripples from Mill Valley that are, you know, spreading so far and wide and over such a great distance of time. Yeah. So a question. How was it ever back to the store, although the, the road trips and the uh, touring sounds pretty exciting. Uh, have, was there ever a time in the store where the customers and the employees just started playing music, just sat down yeah. and started playing music yeah. together? Yeah. We would have to yell at them every now and then to tune up, <laughs> right? Because it was just like this guy was a half tone. Off. So we'd stop everybody would tune up all right go for it you know and did you have events at the store as well we did we had uh bernard guitar show. Yeah. Huh? we had the bernard guitar show. 
Well, the first guitar show ever, right? Was it? Yeah, you know, vintage guitar show turned into a whole big thing, but we had the first one. Yeah. And, you know, uh, it was really, you know, John Cipollino came down and the guy with the four less balls, he showed up. Yeah. And um, it was, uh, you know, a bunch of cool guitars. You know, we just hung up on the wall and everybody went around and looked at them and had a good time. Yeah. My, my recollection is we allowed anyone to come and sell their guitars that that day. Right. Anyone could bring their own guitar and hang it on the wall, put a sign on it and try and sell it. With yeah. And no what I remember place. was the store was absolutely jam-packed with people yeah. flooding out onto the sidewalk. It was hugely successful for uh I've got still I've got pictures of a couple of the shows here in my studio. Yeah, yeah. cool. I'd like to see those as a memory. Yeah. I've got a few definitely in one of them. Yeah. Got a picture of the rompers drum kit if you guys remember the rompers made in the during world war ii it had all rosewood lugs on it you know everybody just loved all the old stuff that we had laying around and uh uh yeah the, yeah I, I have a great picture of lulu at that guitar show uh talking with a customer and you know taking care of business uh, yeah the girls at Prudent music we wanted to talk about them yeah, let's talk, i was just going to segue into that because it wasn't just a boys club there were no. women at Prune music so let's include them too so lindy was david's uh secretary and took care of uh, a lot of accounting stuff which she still does today i think she you know that's not what she's trained for but that's what she ended up doing uh because of prune music so there again her life was affected by being david's secretary david mm -hmm. was the boss you know he was the guy that ran the store we all just agreed on that you know and he was the guy you know i, I ruled with an iron hand he did he was <laughs> a really guy, hard to work for you know but well, he uh, i asked him once what should i charge for this repair and i did some electronic work and he said you just make up a number yeah <laughs> yeah, he was tough. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> so what other women besides Lindy? Paulette. Pearson. Paulette was the secretary for David as well. At uh, some point, she came on a little later. And she was married to David's cousin, Mark, at, later at one point. Come on in. Uh, sure. And they had uh, Devil's Gulch Ranch out uh, in Ocasio. Uh, Hey, don't, let's not forget Michelle Steverson later on, right? That's right, Michelle. Michelle, Michelle. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, wonderful. She was an anchor for a long time later in Prune, you know. Yeah, real good bass player, real wonderful person. Yeah, and of course, Patrick, Absolutely. And all that. Yeah. And did you have a kind of Prune music family? Oh yeah. Did you email somebody? Yeah. Or why? Who's in the family? Well, we used to go out to Randy and Ravens uh, for dinner a lot, and uh, uh, Larry and Wendy Craig at the time. She, uh, Larry and Wendy were married, and uh, uh, and Lindy and I. You know, we we hung out. And, Don't uh, forget yeah, Jack O'Hare. We have to mention Carla. Sorry, Larry. Go ahead. Oh, Jack O'Hare is a some a name that we're leaving out. He was he was an eggs over easy along with Audie Delone. Yeah, and um, he watched behind. He was behind the counter as well. Right? That's right. And, and Jack O'Hara behind the counter. counter. He was just hanging out there. My cousin Mark Pasternak worked there for quite a That's while. That's right. He sure did. Yeah, yeah. sure. And he he had that the 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 Gulch the Ranch out there in the Casios. Uh, so that came out. That sort of came through and that. Was, and and there was the, Patrick Burke. Well, yeah, Patrick came well later. Uh, and he became, be more in the 80s i think yeah he became an owner later yeah uh, lee yeah. michaels lee michaels oh, that's right lee, we're wasn't talking lee? about the girls now i thought but anyway yeah lee michaels well we're talking the the prune family okay yeah okay Jan well, Tangent. Kind of reputation though because i i got accosted by larry thomas who was one of the founders of guitar center and he told me he said man randy we could at guitar center we just couldn't keep up with you guys you know and, and i said what are you talking about larry you sold your half or, or whatever you had for 200 million dollars what do you mean you couldn't we were totally broke the whole time no 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 i mean the the back room you you guys were a cultural institution we were yeah. just a bunch of weirdo guys selling you know ripping people off <laughs> yeah. the same thing was true with don weir 
you know. Absolutely it was. Although the best advice Don Weir ever gave was, uh, if you want to open a music store, you should open across the street from me, right? So that we can have competition back and forth. We'll both, both make a million dollars. Who's Don right? Weir? Don Weir's Music City on Columbus in San Francisco was another big music store. The Beatles got their gear from Don Weir when they came in 64. And, you know, so he was around. Did the Beatles ever come into your store? No, <laughs> I don't think so. But Randy's dealt with uh, Paul, right? Um, I've dealt with uh, Paul and George yeah. and uh, the whole bunch of those British rockers, Pete Townsend, the Rolling Stones. Um, yeah, I, I met them. And uniformly, they're all great guys. There's yeah. a great uh, vignette with, with, uh, with uh, George. He's sitting there with all these guitars hanging on the wall behind him. And he points over his shoulder and goes, that's what we needed in the Beatles, you know, left <laughs> all. <laughs> right? Okay, before we, we start He's pointing out a Les Paul guitar in case, you know, the non-guitar players didn't get that. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, the Rolling Stones brought me all their guitars, their uh, tour, American touring guitars. Uh, and, you know, I knew Alan Rogan and he just brought them all to me. And they were in such bad shape. I could not believe it, you know. Um, I, you know, I just couldn't believe it. Someone had installed um, a humbucking pickup in this Telecaster with a, a, I could tell it wasn't even a chisel. It was a screwdriver, you know. Oh. It just chipped it all to hell. And, and you know, that's one of, you know, Keith Richards' main guitars was this Telecaster. <laughs> in, a, in such bad shape. But I made them good. But there was a whole lot of them. Uh, well, those just, guys, you know, those guys were clueless. I was with them one yeah. time in Paris, and they were recording. And Ronnie is saying, "Man, is there anything you can do to my amp to get mid more mid range out of it?" I, I, and I'm thinking, "Man, I don't have any tools. I, I don't know what you say." I go over there and look at his amp, which is one that I built, <laughs> and the middle tone control is at zero. Right? I turned it up to three and a half or four, and he's like, "Wow." <laughs> what did you do hey everybody come listen to this they were wonderful guys absolutely the the best to hang out with but totally clueless and they didn't give a shit really it didn't matter yeah you know the tentacles of prune music are what i think is a really important aspect of this story because earlier you mentioned david Faison. i was on the road with david Faison off and on for like five years you know going all over the place with various groups one of which was Les Dudak, Dudek, Mike Finnegan and Jimmy Krieger right, band right so he that was after Country Joe he wasn't working with them anymore and then Tom Ewell who yeah, yeah. Uh, haven't mentioned Tom Ewell and Kate Kenfield who were really part of the family <laughs> as a matter of fact David's now married to Kate Kenfield. <laughs> yeah, right. That's the girls of prune music. That's okay. the girls of prune music. So, uh, you know, I was on the road with Tommy off and on for quite a few years. Delaney there. and Bonnie, if they brought, you know. Yeah, uh, Delaney and Bonnie. They'd bring right. the guitars from Delaney and Bonnie and I'd work on them. Yeah. Right. And uh, and Eric Clapton came in on that tour and we all went out and dropped acid afterwards. But Bill, yeah. you mentioned david Faison, and i yeah. i want to mention him again i first referred to him as the guy with the truckload of gear in berkeley for country right. Joe, but he he was instrumental for me it, because he said uh, hey i've got this little practice amp is there anything for you can do to it for barry melton that'll just blow his mind and so i yeah. stripped it and rebuilt it as a high power put a 12 inch jbl in it took it out to the front and who was hanging around there, but Carlos. And I said, hey, Carlos, would you play this amp? And, you know, I did see it works, but I don't know if it sounds any good or not. And he said, oh, I don't want to play that. It's a little Fender Princeton, it's a practice amp. And I said, no, man, I boosted it. So he finally plugs in and it wails, right? It's just, and he's, he's a player of inspiration. So he's playing phenomenally. The front yeah. doors are open on a summer day. There's a crowd gathering. He finishes at the end and he goes, he looks at it and he says, shit, man, that little thing really boogies. And then yeah. remember, so I started boogieizing all of these little Princetons. Right. And that, that. It did, you had a, a name tag on the front that is black and it said boogie. And on right. the back in, in, uh, in Sharpie, it said prune. 
You know, yeah, and you know yeah. why I did that, Larry, because uh, I kept them as stealthy as possible for a long time. I must have done 100 or 200. I don't know how many of those I did, but I heard some kids at Prune Music one time, and the kids said, I don't get it, man. I just saw Carlos. He headlined Winterland with a Princeton, and man, mine isn't barely good enough for the garage. <laughs> I thought, oh, wait a minute. Fender, Fender's getting all of the credit for this amp I built in their cabinet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh did you was it was it gratifying to see young kids who grew up to be professional musicians go through your story i mean you watched them mature and go on to professional careers yeah yeah well <laughs> archie comes to mind you know the f top of mind for me i i've never peter, peter manu used to come in a lot sure. Sure. Yeah. Bass fingers yeah um, pete yeah. on you there is yeah. a great guy i hadn't thought of for a long time well, that guy Isham used to come in all the time. Mark Isham used to come in even with sure. uh, Terry Bozio. Terry Bozio, yeah, right? Another one. Yeah. A place. And, and hey, let's not forget, since we're also talking about Mill Valley, that right around the corner was Mill Valley Cyclery. And Charlie Kelly, the roadie for our favorite band, the Sons of Champlin, would drop off a bunch of gear for, for us to work on. He'd go around the corner and get bike parts because they were inventing mountain bike and clunkers we called them at that time. Yeah. yeah that's yeah that, i i that's where i went for my uh uh caesar at mill valley cycle we made my clunkers yeah. and uh still got one there were there were schwins with uh 10 speed uh derailers on them yeah very uh, so made we, my first one <laughs> we'd go on a clunk the word mountain bike hadn't been invented yet yeah, right. You still That's go right. up Mount Town most every day these days. What, what you're describing is a kind of a fertility in No Valley of creativity. I mean, we've we've had I've interviewed Wendy Craig. I've interviewed many of the bikers, and it really isn't that different of a story of yours. It's young people having a good time modifying things as they need to, and inadvertently creating an industry. Yeah. And becoming backing in accidentally almost into their professions as adult, which has worked out really well, it appears, for you and for the bikers. Correct? Change, change the world in some ways. Yeah, change the world. Yeah. Yeah. Be well, the whole time we're changing the world. And uh, I know I saw in your little, uh, uh, you sent us uh, an outline of, the talk so we wouldn't be surprised by all this and uh uh you kept mentioning you used the word hippies a lot and i'm thinking back and yeah yeah we were hippies but i you know, i somehow i didn't i you know i don't know that a lot of hippies that were real you know hippies were really thinking about being hippies you know i think they were just doing what they wanted to do that was a generation that kind of broke out after the 50s being so stale and then all of a sudden through the 60s it morphed into this thing where people were doing what they wanted to do well said bill i, I think so too because i wanted to be a beatnik when yeah. i was being a high school rebel but i realized i was a little too young so you're right we were just doing what we were doing and years later it was called hippies but yeah. But we weren't hippies they just named us that but we had been doing what we've been doing for years yeah 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 i, and I can see why all the uh uh san francisco bands came to our store because we weren't a mom and pop mom and pop store it was a hip store you know and sometimes you could smell things out in the front from the back room they knew that they were in the right place and sometimes they'd go back there too yeah how was it live, ha having your store right next to brother's tavern that was convenient. Yeah. <laughs> well, I heard a lot of good stories in the Brothers Tavern. I used, to, I used to play pool with Dan Hicks over there occasionally, but they, they would open at 6 a.m. And so they were open for many hours before we would even show up to open work. Open at 6 and close at 2 a.m.? That's right. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. commitment. Yeah. Well, they were, a, they were a family bar, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so listen, we've got to get on to the questions, but I have a, a question to ask you all before we segue into the next part of this event. Two questions. In your youthful 
imaginations. Could any of you have imagined that your life would go on the trajectory that it did? That you would, in many ways, continue to be exactly who you were when you were young, and 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 be able to live that life professionally. Not I. No. I knew I liked fixing guitars, but it took uh, David uh, to tell me that I could charge for it. <laughs> I had never thought of that. And here I'm so poor, and I had never thought of turning that into my life's work, which that's one of the things I do. Hey, hey Larry, it was it's David. We owe it all to David because yeah. I never thought about fixing amps for money either. You just had to do it to keep your, uh, your scene working. Is it well, true I mean, that some months, I mean, Prune Music itself as a, a business venture, who is it that said some months we had to decide if we wanted to pay the rent or the electrical bill? We well, never I think back to that guy, uh, 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 Larry Thomas, when you know he, he was making two, sold his partnership for two hundred and twenty million or something like that. And no, we were we were impoverished. I was, that's for sure. It didn't take as much to live back then, and we we could live frugally, but we never made real money there. That I recall, I didn't. I um, didn't. Either. Yeah. But, you know, I started off being a, a playing at a young age. I was uh, sort of really good on the trumpet. And I was uh, just dedicated to Satchmo. And I learned all his songs note for note. And so I got to play an out when I was about 13. And uh, so for me, it was just a continuation of that along. I mean, that's what I was doing. And... Uh, yeah, you know, I'd already been touring uh, one time with a Dixieland band when I was really young. I had to join the union and all that. And, hmm. so, yeah. Okay, one last question. Is there anything we haven't talked about that any of you would like to add? Yeah, I do. Uh, Sal Trentino came in and uh, replaced uh, Randy. And he, uh, did, he, he was so good. Uh, he, he turned into Neil's uh, amp repair guy. And he really was a good uh, tube amp guy. He didn't just fix the amp, he made them sound good. And so he didn't necessarily always go by the book, but um, he sure made amps sound good. Yeah, I don't want to forget John, John Bird too, another dear soul, you know. Oh yeah, he, he and uh, Larry Holman also. Yeah. Yeah, Larry, Larry Holman's been on the chat. in the counter as well quite a bit. Yep, yep, spoke to him recently. He's doing up well up in Nevada City. If you oh, click cool. on the chat, you'll see a bunch of stuff from Larry Holman right on the chat. There you go. I'm yeah. gonna read some of this out loud. Come on, Larry. Um, hey, Larry. <laughs> anything else that we want to add? Yeah, um, I just thought it was such a grand, wonderful place. It's you know, so much was happening at Prune Music, and I went by there recently and peered in through the window. And of course, it's dark now, and, and no one's renting it. And it seems so small and lifeless, and it's hard to somehow picture that as this wonderful, lively, vibrant place that it was, because it was happening every day. And right now it just looks so small and sad and I, it doesn't, I can hardly imagine how that could still be the same place. Well, it's alive in you all. That's yeah, I drove by it when it was for rent not long ago myself after Deborah got us thinking about this again. And I'm thinking, oh, empty, huh? Maybe we ought to take another shot. You know? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> not me. Not me either. <laughs> That's what I said a while ago. I said, let's get all the rock stars together, pitch in a little and fire uh, that thing back up. <laughs> yeah. I got a better idea. Let's just get the back room. Let's forget the store. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, isn't that what one of the owners, who is it that was that you, Randy, that told me someone uh, when it was time to sell, he says, I'm going to have to buy this. If I don't, where am I going to go to hang out? That was Lee Michaels who yeah, said that. Yeah, that was Lee Michaels. Yeah. And sure enough, he did hang out there every day. And his one main purpose was to make sure nobody parked in the wrong parking spot out back. Yeah. and he'd stay there and just he was a parking lot monitor so, <laughs> another name that we didn't mention yet that larry can shed a lot of light on and that's jan tangent who he's yeah, jan tangent oh. would be there every night after work and uh but he had family like music school and uh he's here he, for he years got to, uh, uh, Oh, go ahead. Stay in, stay in the camera here, Dougie. Get my, a chair. My teacher for years. Thank you for mentioning him, Larry. Yeah. He, was part of, he was part of the culture big time. And, oh, yeah. 
talk it was about a long the evening. <laughs> consummate hippie, consummate performer. Every, I mean, just he had the vibe going on. He did. He did. Uh, Dougie's got some stories, so <laughs> I'm not sure they're appropriate for this venue, but yeah, they're pretty he, funny. He's the man. Okay. Uh, we're talking to Jen. I said, "Family light music, really? That's you think that's a." You think that's a good name? He said, you think crew music is a good name? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got to take some questions here, guys. You ready? Yeah. Um, here, this is from Shermano. I've been to the Meat Locker. My son's guitar teacher, John Egan, and the kid played an unplugged gig where, there when it was a used bookstore that was closing. That's actually a comment, not a question. Um, here's another one from Anthony. What is the story of the Les Paul under the counter at the register? It was really a shotgun. <laughs> I don't remember that. Yeah, I, don't I, don't know. I don't know what he's talking about. Yes, I, you had one with a Florentine cutaway, remember, in the glass case for years? Oh, yeah. So yeah. I know the story about that. Um, uh, it was uh, made by a, a worker at Gibson. And it had a, a sharp cutaway, and it had an interesting. It was a prototype, and the back of the, the of the guitar came up and formed the first, I'd say, oh, uh, quarter inch of the heel of the neck, and so uh -huh. it, it reinforced the neck. And uh, someone had modified it and put humbucking pickups on it, but um, yeah, it was there, and uh, um, uh, it's it very interesting, certainly an unusual Les Paul, but it was, you know, really, really early and it was a prototype. Yeah. Anthony also asks, who is L.X. Prune? Oh, hey, do you have the T-shirt? Yeah, no, it, was oh, on yeah our, I do. it was on our phone. I'll show you a picture of L.X. Prune. It was just a character made up. It was made up by Dave Sheridan. Dave Sheridan. Yeah. All our artwork and posters. Okay, let's see it. You have to speak something, Bill, to... Uh, Hold to on. Get front and set. There you go. Take it higher. Upside down. <laughs> Turn upside down. <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> Dave Sheridan was a poster artist and a comic book. Well, artist. That's how I felt when I back in the day when I was wearing this shirt. There it is. All the, art. the fabulous furry Freak Brothers. He was the uh, that was his right. comic book. Yeah, yeah he yeah. did that for us. Yeah. And where's and the bowling? Alex Prune, right there. You're looking at him. Okay, so where's the bowling shirt, too? You had your own bowling league. Yeah, we had our own bowling league. And this is the back of the shirt. Well, th this is an ode to Patrick because he liked to get a lot of strikes. And so we put that on the front. And this is the back. And that's Patrick as well. He had it done in his own image. <laughs> uh -huh, nice. Yeah. Okay, here's some comments. This is from Ramona to the panelists. David, are you the Kessner who played with Brighton or Britain? Brittani, excuse me, Brittani. Yes, I remember, and say hi to Ramona. I remember Ramona, yeah. Hi, Ramona. Yes. Okay, this is from Larry Lee Holman. Hi, Larry, Randy, Bill, and David from Larry Lee Holman. Yeah, Larry. Oh. Larry. Okay, here's uh, Ramona. David, oh, wait. Uh, Oh, wait, that's a repeat. Okay, this is to, from Larry Lee. Martha's Laundry, can I have your autograph? Yeah. <laughs> I, I tried out for Martha's Laundry. I was a bass player at the time. Really? And I, I tried out for Martha's Laundry, and I didn't hear it back from them for over a month or more. And by then, I joined with Bill over to this uh, band in uh, Lagunitas. But I think I made, I, as I remember, I made the cut, but I couldn't. I couldn't do it. But I tried out for this band anyway. That's, what I remember was the graffiti in the bathroom that somebody had written. As, the way I can remember it, it said, did you wash out Martha's laundry? And somebody <laughs> underneath that put, no, man, I just hung it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, someone's suggesting that the, the name uh, Prune Music came from the Frank Zappa, the Dukes of Prune. Uh, that's just a comment, and here's another comment: the Royal Flush, or the Four Flusher. Four Flusher. Those that was from Charlie Deal. Deal. That was yeah. a bass. Oh, that's it's right. That's what he called the bass. The Four Flusher. And um, here we go. Someone says the legendary Charlie um, Mark Mouse. Mark was a bass player. Okay. Uh, 
here's one, Craig Chikakia. How do you say this last name? Chik Chikisa. Uh, Kisisa would come in on a skateboard at 16 years old. He played with Jefferson Starship. Starship. Right. So he used to go over to Paul's house over on the cliffs, uh, uh, the cliff house over. He, he is just to the west of uh, Golden Gate Bridge, you know, and I'd be fixing guitars there. I'd go over there about every month or two months and fix guitars in front of, they had three story windows. Anyhow, this kid starts showing up and asking me questions about Les Pauls and stuff. And I'm going, what's this kid doing over here at Paul's house? Little did I know he's from Sacramento, that he was turning into this, that they were starting this uh, Jefferson Starship and he was turning into their lead guitar player. But he was just a kid at the time. Yeah. Uh, was there a recording studio behind you all in the parking lot? That came later. That I was think. later. Yeah, that was much okay. later. Um... I used to uh, fix guitars in that building. And um, <laughs> until, uh, uh, I guess, Lee Michaels bought uh, the store, and then he turned that into a, a recording studio. Uh, Lee, Larry says, counterculture musicians is what we were. Um, and here's another one from Eric. Larry, maybe you should reopen new pure, pure prune music in Mill Valley and re-instill new music life in Mill Valley. That's just what Doug just now suggested. Yeah. Um, and here's Shimano. Russ, my old departed barber, had stories about y'all. Of course, the barber shop was right near there too. That's right. And right next door to the uh, to the uh, brothers. Yeah. Never noticed that barber shop. It was there. <laughs> we weren't really getting our hair. Cut. I didn't have any need for it at the time. <laughs> okay. Well, I think we pretty much covered it all. Um, I mean, there's more. The Mesa Boogie Amps and the church recording studio and and the 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 things that people went on to do all interested in their own right in my interviews with musicians they talk about the church recording studio in San Anselmo and the amps are always a discussion I mean you guys really had uh, left a mark in so many ways so I want to thank you all for your enthusiasm and your expertise and your sense of community and love and life you have for each other and for participating in this evening's event. Um, here's a comment from says Lippman. Hi, says it says this has been fantastic. Oh, Thank great. you all. Okay. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Deborah. Deborah, 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 Deborah you uh, you put us all back together again, and it's yeah. Really good thank you. To see yeah. So thank you, and wonderful. Mill Valley was just a, a sanctuary of of wonderful creativity at that time, yeah. and man, the magic. You know, we, that era had so much to do with it. If we had been in Fresno, uh, you know, or Bakersfield, who knows? I don't think any of this would have happened. No. Well, I come from Fresno, and I can assure you it wouldn't have. <laughs> Although it did have its, it has its moments in its own way. But yeah. you know, there is still, I have to say, a thriving community in Mill Valley. Don't be blinded by the glitz. There's a lot of soul here still, and yeah. it's that soul that hangs on to moments that you all created. Um, in fact, before as I close. Um, I want to say to our audience, for those of you who have enjoyed our weekly email history vignettes composed by local historian Chuck Olenberg, you'll ple be pleased to hear that those vignettes have been now bound into a new book called Mill Valley History Vignettes, Vol Volume 2. It's a compilation of 152 of Chuck's most recent vignettes. And volume two makes a wonderful companion to Chuck's original book, Mill Valley History Vignettes, which continues to be available in our Mill Valley Historical Society bookstore. Also available in our bookstore is Adventures of Two Coast Miwok Children, written by my dear friend and fellow board member, Betty Girk. This beautiful book brings alive Marin County's Coast Miwok legacy as it explores the daily, daily lives of a real boy and girl who lived in neighboring villages on San Francisco Bay in the late 1700s. The little boy in the story is named Huik Musa, but he would grow up to be known as Chief Marin, Marin County's namesake. It's a precious and truly beautiful book and a great gift for children and adults. 
Also, please celebrate 50 years of Sweetwater goodness with the opening of Mill Valley Public Library's new gallery exhibition, Listen to the Music. See photographs, posters, live recordings, and more from some of the most influential and beloved musicians who performed at the iconic Mill Valley music venue during the 80s and 90s. The exhibition is made up of items from Jeannie Patterson's collection donated to the library by the late talent booker and manager of the Sweetwater and displayed here for the first time. And if you're interested in to delve deeper into the lives and stories of some of the people we spoke about tonight, please do go to the Mill Valley Public Library's oral history collection and listen to the oral histories of musicians, Marty Ballin, Lauren Rowan, Huey Lewis, Austin DeLone, Jesse Barish, Rob Moitoza, Dave Getz, David Freiberg, Jimmy Dillon, Bobby Weir, Bill Champlin and Terry Haggerty, yeah. uh, Dory Collar, Larry Craig, you, Wendy, your uh, former wife, Bill Fat, uh, Phil Fat, Reedy Abrams, and music teachers Bob Greenwood and Joe Angelo, and many more. Those are just some of the people I've interviewed. There's more. And you may not recognize some of the names I just mentioned, but I guarantee you no doubt know their music. And finally, if you're in town, you might want to check out Big Brother and the Holding Company that's going to be playing at the Sweetwater this coming Friday. Big Brother drummer Dave Getz has been our first Wednesday speaker in the past, and he has a wonderful oral history. Finally, please do join us next month. That's December 7th as 2022 as the music continues for Village Music, the best little record store in yeah. the world yeah. with yeah. Old John Goddard. John. Yes, John, or another <laughs> John. Yes. Yes, wonderful. This is going to be a wonderful event. Maybe you all will join us. Um, special, well, I think that wraps it up. Uh, special thanks again to our panel. And of course, special thanks to you, our audience, uh, I both for your interest and your patronage. Till next month, be well and good night. Bye.